holds the William and Patricia Lamoff Chair in United States Constitution at Hillsdale College, where he has taught since 2000. Dr. Morrissey is the author of eight books on statesmanship and political philosophy. His most recent book, The Dilemma of Progressivism, How Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson Reshaped the American Regime of Self-Government, is the companion volume to his previous book on Self-Government, self The American Theme, Presidents of the Founding and Civil War. He received his BA, summa cum laude, from Kenyon College and his MA and PhD from the New School for Social Research. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Times, and the American Political Science Review, among many other publications. Today, he will be speaking on the timely topic, What Would Abraham Lincoln Do? Constitutional Crisis and the Challenge of Self-Government. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Will Morrissey. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you, David, for inviting me here today. Um, if Abraham Lincoln were alive today, the first thing he'd say to us is, you think you've got troubles. <laughs> Americans today regret the sharpness of our political divisions. 150 years ago today, Abraham Lincoln addressed his fellow citizens in his first inaugural address. That phrase, fellow citizens, tended to the optimistic side given the proclaimed secession of seven states from the Union. Before doing anything, Lincoln had a few things to say. Before saying anything, he formed some thoughts, a wise procedure which ought to serve as an example for all of us more of the time. He began by telling his audience that in giving his inaugural address, he complied with a custom as old as the government itself. He concluded famously with an appeal to the better angels of our nature. His argument moves exactly that way, from custom to nature. The link between custom and nature is reason. I said he made an argument. It's a logical argument, not merely an appeal to passions, nor, nor is it a set of sound bites. As an experienced lawyer, he expected the jury of his fellow citizens to understand a clear chain of thought governed by the principle of non-contradiction. If he were alive today, he might attempt the same thing, and many of his listeners would find it refreshing, or at least novel. <laughs> Others might find it confusing, but they could get used to it. In complying with custom, with human convention, Lincoln affirmed his law-abidingness his respect for and fidelity to the agreements men and women make with each other, especially in so far as they are fellow citizens. He assured Southerners and Northerners that he would abide by his party's political platform, another agreement among citizens, which had first affirmed the rights of states to permit slavery within their confines, and second, which had supported the fugitive slave law part of that larger law or convention, the United States Constitution at that time. He argued that such conventions must remain in force until altered or abolished by the rulers of the United States, namely the sovereign people speaking in a constitutional majority. That went for him as president. It also went for the South. As the duly elected constitutional executive of the United States, he intended to hold them to that. Secession from a constitutional union without the consent of the other parties to that convention is, he said, the essence of anarchy. After appealing to the rule of law, to constitutional legitimacy, the highest custom, Lincoln then observed a limitation of law. If one part of the union believes slavery is right, it will obey the law suppressing the foreign slave trade with very little alacrity. If another part of the Union believes slavery is wrong, it will obey the fugitive slave law with equally little alacrity. Secession would make each of these laws not merely difficult to enforce, but void in half of the former Union. But these two co new countries could not separate physically. Why then, he asked, would treaties between these countries respecting slave trade or fugitive slaves prove more effective than those laws within the Union? Is Union, therefore, not antecedent 
to law. Lincoln continued, offering a new constitutional convention, invoking prudence, patriotism, Christianity, God himself, the creator of the nature, which appears for the first time as the last word of his plea to the jury of his fellow citizens. Flexible with respect to convention, which fellow citizens can change, Lincoln concludes this invocation of nature and of nature's God, beings of endurance and of permanence, respectively, beings that set the standard for human conventions. Our laws of nature are the laws of nature and of nature's God, not antecedent to the union that is antecedent to the laws. After all, Americans had seceded in 1776 unilaterally from the political bands or conventions with the British Empire. The result of that secession had not been anarchy, but the very constitutional union now threatened by this attempt at secession. What's the difference? The difference was that the secession of 1776 had been founded upon the truth of natural right, understood as the God-given equal claim to each of, of each hum, individual human being to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The secessionists of 1861, by contrast, founded their claim to secession either upon a non-natural ancestral right to liberty, a liberty from which those who, uh, those who shared none of the citizen's ancestry could therefore be excluded, right? or they founded it upon the flat claim that nature itself had denied the capacity for self-government, the full exercise of economic and political liberty to one or more races within the United States while granting that capacity to another race, rightfully the master of the others. From this disagreement upon the moral, of, uh, moral principle of natural right flowed two opposing political differences. The slaveholding states disagreed with the free states concerning their regime. The slaveholding statesmen also disagreed with the non-slaveholding statesmen concerning the character of the American polity, regime and polity, two, two uh, items that are on that uh, list that, that I've given you, that pa uh, piece of paper, and I'll just run through it very quickly. By regime, I mean what Aristotle meant in describing political rule in human societies. A regime consists of three distinct but closely related elements. First, the persons who rule. Are they one, few, or many? Are they good or bad? Are they, are, are they a good or bad character? Second, the second dimension of regimes, the institutions by which rulers rule. This is the structure or the form of the regime. If the people are sovereign, they will likely generate institutions that enable them to exercise their rule, Congress for their representatives, for example. If it's a monarchy, the czar, of course, will have his secret police. So the institutions are likely to back up the ruling, the, the ruling dimension of the regime, or should I say the, the persons who are ruling within any regime. The third dimension of a regime is the way of life that's shared by the citizens of the regime. Are they warriors or merchants? Are they hunters or farmers? Fathers and mothers or moms and dads? That's the, that's the regime. A, uh, to understand politics clearly, orient yourselves toward that and you can't go too far wrong. And I, I say this for many years of experience <laughs> thinking about these things and listening to other people give their thoughts on them. By polity, that's a word I just assigned to something that is a, another phenomenon that's important to, to keep track of. And that's the, the, the conjunction of size and degree of centralization within a political community. Size and the degree of centralization. Uh, by that I mean, I'll give you an ex examples. In the ancient world, uh, a polis, sometimes called a city-state, was small but centralized, wasn't it? Because everyone who was a ruler in a polis, even if it was the many, who ruled, you could get them all in one place so that they could deliberate amongst themselves at one time. That's a, uh, that's a small but centralized entity. The ancient world also had those big sprawling empires, places like Persia, for example, uh, where uh, they were big, but they were decentralized. Uh, the, the various provinces typically had a fairly significant degree of self-government for day-to-day -day affairs in, in an ancient empire. 
Later on, you had an, a, few, a couple more uh, entities cropping up. Feudalism, feudal societies, where you have basically uh, 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 concentrations of authority, a king, a set of aristocrats, uh, uh, the, the institutions of a church, uh, uh, law courts, and so forth, each with their own independent source of revenue, several of them with their own source, independent source of military, right? And this would be, these, these sources of authority would circulate in a kind of colloidal suspension, or a kind of equilibrium, right? This was replaced by a, a fairly large entity, but decentralized, in other words. Um, the thing that replaced that, of course, was the modern state, Machiavelli's invention. Strongly centralized, large but strongly centralized, a powerhouse that could defeat a feudal, a feudal society, certainly a polis, and could probably knock off an ancient empire unless it got its act together. Or you could have a third possibility, another possibility, which would be the United States. A state, all right, you know, modern, recognizably a modern state, but a confederal state, what Publius calls a compound republic. That is, a state in which the central government has its own independently funded sources of authority and whose laws are the supreme law of the land. But within that confederation, the states have their own independently funded sources of authority and their laws are supreme within their own borders. Now, there's a link in the United States regime between the regime proper and the polity, or the con uh, between republicanism and fe confederalism. And that is an article for section four, in which it says, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. That is, the confederal structure of the American polity shall reinforce the Republican character of all the American regimes. Slavery presented a problem here. In the 1790s, James Madison, framer of the Constitution, congressman, future president, slaveholder, but also uh, opponent of slavery, wrote himself a note, which for obvious purposes never saw publication until the 20th century. Quote, in proportion as slavery prevails in a state the government, however democratic in name, must be aristocratic in fact. The power lies in a part instead of the whole, in the hands of property, not of numbers. All the ancient popular governments were for this reason aristocracies. The majority were slaves. He continued, the southern states of America are on the same principle aristocracies. In his own Virginia, he estimated slaves and non-freeholding whites amounted to nearly three-fourths of the population. How then shall the federal government enforce the Republican Guarantee Clause? It's a time bomb in the Constitution, essentially. In his recent book, Mastering America, the historian Robert Bonner shows how Southern statesmen initially centered their political strategy on defending slaveholding oligarchic regimes by means of the confederal polity established by the founders. Senator John C. Calhoun epitomized these statesmen. So long as the structure of the union provided a protective shield for slaveholders from foreign regimes that discountenanced slavery, most notably, of course, the British Empire, right? Uh, Calhoun upheld nationalism, playing the war hawk in 1812, for example. In this, he followed his fellow South Carolinian, Charles Pinckney, who told the state's ratifying convention back in 1788 that only a Quixote would suppose that a state with a dense slave population could long maintain her independence if she stood alone or was only connected with the southern states. But by the late 1820s, as the slave states prospered within the Union, Calhoun could begin of thinking of just such independence. As is well known, by the end of his life, he could set the price of the continuation of the unified confederal polity at the level of his concurrent majority notion, complete with a dual presidency from one from the north, one from the south. Throughout the 1850s, both southern secessionists and southern uni uni unionists disagreed not only not over slavery, 
but over which policy better defended slavery. By 1861, the Confederate States of America President Jefferson Davis lamented, quote, the evil hour in which some of our most distinguished Southern statesmen, he would have thought of Jefferson, uh, Madison, who admitted that slavery was an evil, an admission that took from us all ground save that of necessity, the sort of argument that Thomas Jefferson made. We've got the wolf by the ears. Uh, we can't let him go. On the contrary, Davis and the secessionists contended that slavery formed an indispensable foundation for their new regime. When in desperation near the end of the war, Davis proposed to arm the remaining slaves in exchange for a promise of emancipation. The Virginia newspaper editor, George Bagby, replied, and this is one of the quotes that Bonner has unearthed, a surrender of slavery is a surrender of everything. It is a subjugation by the Yankee idea. Subjugated by the Yankee idea, we become Yankees. If we are Yankees, why not be in the, same, in the same union with the rest of the Yankees? Some Southerners were just as logical as Lincoln, in other words. <laughs> Indeed, in 1854, in Jackson, Michigan, not far from where Hillsdale College is located, the Republicans named their party the Republican Party precisely in order, quote, to battle for the first principles of Republican government and against the schemes of aristocracy, the most revolting and oppressive the earth has ever been cursed with. It's right out of the Republican uh, uh, statement of 1854. Despite his recourse to reason and, its pa and to patriotic sentiment, Lincoln's argument in the first inaugural address failed to persuade the Union's regime enemies. He failed to persuade the secessionists because they no longer wanted and no longer believed that they needed the regime or the polity of the American founders, the regime and polity Lincoln considered himself morally and legally bound to defend. I need not detain you with an account of what Lincoln did about that, except to observe that the conduct of the war in its end game stage by his generals aimed at breaking the slave plantation aristocrats and forcing them to earn a living with their own hands. Reportedly, when asked how the plantation owners would survive without their slaves and how the slaves would survive without their plantation owners, he replied tartly, root, hog, or die. Hollywood captured this moment when Scarlett O'Hara found herself unearthing a turnip and vowing never to go hungry again. Being Scarlett, and having the anti-secessionist Rhett Butler in her thrall, she didn't. I have detained you with an account of regimes and of politics because it frames an answer to the question, what would Lincoln do if he returned to us today? To provide an answer to the question uh, just framed, we should, I want to stipulate two additional points. First, we should assume that Lincoln returns to us fully aware of American and indeed of world history in the seven score and 10 years that now separate his first inaugural address from us. This eliminates the need for him to yokel around for a while, gaping at our airplanes and our cell phones and reading up on 20th century history. He's been watching us all this time. Second, and following from that first point, we must measure the distance in the political circumstances between his time and ours. The regime of republicanism and the polity of confederalism remain front and center for us as they were for him, but in a radically different way. It would be nice if you, if you could use Lincoln or the founders as, a kind of, as computers and you could print out uh, answers to the questions that we fed to them. That won't happen, right? We can't do that. The international slave trade, for example, remains with us, and of course Lincoln would op oppose it. But inasmuch as legal slavery has now disappeared from the United States, where would Lincoln find the threat of oligarchy today? America now features several uh, oligarchic structures, uh, business corporations, which are private bureaucracies, uh, professional organizations that require certification for entry into the marketplace, uh, which would be semi-public uh, bureaucracies, and of course the administrative apparatus of the modern state, public bureaucracies. Left on their own, 
private and semi-private uh, bureaucracies will tend to rise and fall depending on whether their services meet some felt need of their fellow citizens, and in the case of the corporations, of buyers and sellers around the world. Such bureaucracies usually fall under the Constitution's Interstate Commerce Clause. Congress may regulate them wisely or foolishly. Congressmen may or may not accept bribes, legal or illegal, from them. But by themselves, they pose no threat to the regime of republicanism. Public bureaucracy is another matter. Tenured public administ uh, bu administrators or bureaucrats derive their claim to rule not from birth or from elections, but from expertise. It's a quasi-aristocratic claim. We rightly rule because we possess scientific knowledge of that realm of human activity our agency for oversees, finance, education, war, family life, business, international relations, medicine, agriculture, transportation. The list is long. I won't continue it. Moreover, we also possess the science of administration itself, whereby we can rule these activities with more efficiency and less prejudice or personal interest than anyone else. By regulating private and semi-public bureaucracies, along with the daily activities of civil associations, families, and individuals, public bureaucracies decisively centralize the American polity, right, making it uh, less confederal. They also transform the American regime. Following at Madison, we can say that insofar as bureaucracy prevails in a state, the government, however democratic in name, must be aristocratic in fact. But here is a crucial distinction. Unlike slaveholders, bureaucrats are not confined to one part of the country. The new aristocracy has been marbled through all regions of our country, from Washington, D.C. to Wasilla, Alaska. Lincoln confronted a semi-aristocratic regime limited to a geographic section. Uh, but uh, but uh, this, this brought the danger of civil war, but it also held out the prospect that the regime might be contained, or failing that, and in response to rebellion, conquered and reconstructed, subject to regime change, in other words. But today's nationwide bureaucratic oligarchy pervades all sections, all climates, all populations of America. Not disunion, but what the, federal, uh, what the founders called statist consolidation. Right, statist consolidation now threatens. What would Lincoln say to that? Well, begin with the fact that Lincoln was a confirmed liberal in the sense that word had in the 18th and 19th centuries. With Locke, liberalism regards labor as prior to capital. Having worked as a ferryman on a river flatboat, Lincoln regarded the right to earn your living by your own efforts and to keep what you've earned as a fundamental element of human flourishing, one that he shared with the haughtiest crown head of Europe and equally, as he explained to Stephen Douglas in one of their debates, with an African-American woman living in slavery. My understanding of the hired laborer is this, he said. A young man finds himself of an age to be dismissed from parental control, moved out of the basement. <laughs> he didn't say that, I did. <laughs> he has for his capital nothing but two strong hands that God has given him, a heart willing to labor and a freedom to choose the mode of his work and the manner of his employment. He finds an employer and works for him in terms according with their mutual consent. With time and effort, he will accumulate surplus capital, raise a family, and do was what he was done by for some unemployed youth of the next generation. Quote, this is the progress that human nature is entitled to. The pursuit of happiness, the great principle for which this government was really formed. Only human beings invest and discover, exercise reason, the self-governing faculty. Only they improve their workmanship while they labor. According, accordingly, the 1860 Republican platform upon which Lincoln stood said this, the people justly view with alarm the reckless extravagance which pervades every department of the federal government. 
A return to rigid eco economy and accountability is indispensable to arrest the systematic plunder of the public treasury by favored partisans. While the s recent startling developments of frauds and corruptions at the federal metropolis show that an entire change of administration is imperatively demanded. <laughs> So I think it's safe to say that Lincoln would like to see a reduction of government expenditures. <laughs> right? At the same time, we shouldn't forget that L Lincoln's Republican Party combined the economic policies of the two predecessor parties, the Whig Party and the Free Soil Party. Uh, the Whigs, I'll start with the Whigs, they weren't libertarians in our sense of the word. In propounding his American system, Senator Henry Clay, the man uh, Lincoln famously called my beau ideal of a statesman, uh, he probably said Bowie ideal, he was a real American, not like me, you know, uh, college professor. And he, right, he, the, uh, Clay endorsed, uh, endorsed public works, as had the Federalists and some Democrats like James Madison. Uh, but these, there's a distinction. These statesmen did not endorse public works in order to directly stimulate employment, as the New Dealers and uh, the, the Social Democrats generally do. The canals, highways, river and harbor improvements, and other enterprises they endorsed were intended to stimulate commerce, to extend the network, extend the network of, free, of the free market across the country, to enhance the founder's regime of commercial, commercial republicanism. In establishing the interstate highway system after World War II, uh, President Eisenhower exhibited strong Whiggish tendencies, you might say. Um, if I have a chance in the, in, the, in the question and answer period, I'll tell you what my father did about the extension of the highway system in New Jersey in 1920. But I'll get back to that. Today, Lincoln might well endorse what we now call infrastructure spending as long as it reinforced interstate commerce, did not serve a merely local intrastate purpose, and didn't amount to a make work program. Jobs should come primarily from the commerce thus assisted, not so much from the projects themselves. That is, such internal improvements will deploy the central government to make civil social institutions stronger rather than to take them over or to dominate them by regulation. Lincoln, it should be added, disagreed with his platform's call for a railroad to the Pacific Ocean on the grounds that it would cost too much. Given today's budget deficit, therefore, he might frown upon federal expenditures on high-speed trains. Now, the free soil side, getting to the free soil side of republicanism, that more clearly addresses the need directly to reduce statism or central government rule over civil society. Americans had settled on, uh, had settled on public lands, of course, and the Republican Party platform endorsed the, what it called free homestead policy, meaning if you had already worked on that land, you'd settled it, you'd chopped down those trees and built a farm, then you would have first rights to uh, acquiring the land with which you had mixed your labor in that Lockean way, right? Again, the first principle of economic liberalism is to secure the natural right to keep what you have earned. Given the enormous resources now owned by the United States government, some $233 billion of non-military property, plants, equipment, and given also the astonishing level of federal indebtedness, Lincoln might very well try to devise ways of, as we now say, privatizing many of these assets, of seeing people could purchase more things that they would then have the right to keep. Indeed, he might consider experimenting with the privatization of that Whiggish interstate highway system that has begun to crumble under uh, interstate hands. As for the bureaucracy itself, the Americans of the 19th century, uh, Lincoln very much included, saw no need for a bureaucracy of any su substantial size. Public administration of the, in the in America of Madison, Clay, Calhoun, and Lincoln fell to the political parties and not to license professional uh, experts. This meant that public administration was highly responsive to political events, most particularly elections. A change of uh, presidential administrations really meant a change in administration. A fe the federal government was restaffed with persons committed to the party platform of the president, controlled financially by a Congress that was equally partisan. 
today, Lincoln would quite likely look to expand the number of job, government jobs open to non-professionals, that is to say, partisans. If the size, scope, and responsibility of bureaucracies are curtailed by the economizing and homesteading privatization policies I just mentioned, a critical mass of political appointments would then enact meaningful changes in other policies of those bureaucracies, changes legitimized by victories in elections. That is to say, with contact with the sovereign people for a change, not just going off on your own and regulating as you please. This would have the additional benefit of making political participation much more broadly appealing than it has become. Real jobs and real policies would once again be at stake every four years. To those who would worry that this would bring back, it would bring a return to the corruption that bedeviled public administration in the late 19th century, I ask first, what do you think we have now? If not corruption, legal and illegal. Second, I remind you that the early civil service reformers, including the very young Theodore Roosevelt, had nothing to do with the later movement of progressivism. That is, their ideas didn't. Teddy sure did, but the ideas didn't. Uh, with its abandonment of natural rights, its elevation of the science of administration above politics. Those civil service reformers, those early guys, were post-Civil War Lincoln men. Although, of course, as we know, Roosevelt declined into progressivism in his later years. Finally, uh, the, there's, there's some interesting things about foreign policy that Lincoln might say. Because Lincoln did have contact with some foreign policy, even though, of course, he was preoccupied right, with, the, uh, with, the, with the Civil War. Um, and uh, he would recognize, for one thing, that our, that our circumstances have been revolutionized in the past 150 years. Having witnessed the great world wars of the past century, he would understand how the worldwide battle against far worse tyrannies than his America ever saw had made this revolution necessary. Nonetheless, we can cautiously derive a few principles of foreign policy from Lincoln's positions, uh, taken under very different uh, circumstances. He described our condition in 1838 in his Lyceum Address, one of his earliest uh, published addresses. Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us with a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasure of the earth, our zone accepted, to the, in their military chest with a Bonaparte as a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. Now, allowing for a certain pardonable exaggeration and all that, even in 1838, today we would not necessarily make so sanguine a judgment. Our geopolitical circumstances have changed. We're much more powerful than we were then, but also more exposed because the world is simply smaller now in terms of technology and so on. Further, because we are more powerful, we're now also more targeted, more often targeted by our, uh, the enemies of our regime. Lincoln addressed foreign policy at the beginning and at the end of his national political career. Throughout his lifetime, America's major international rival was Great Britain, which had yet to recover from the contretemps of 1787 through 1813. Great Britain had adopted a policy of containment regarding the United States, which it regarded as an uncannily large mirror of itself potentially a large giant island, right, with an already extensive merchant fleet and a growing manufacturing base. We today face a policy of anti-Americanism against us, attempts to cut us down in the world. As a young, as a young uh, congressman in the late 1840s, Lincoln, as you know, opposed war in Mexico. He did so on two grounds, one of them largely irrelevant now, but the other still very much alive. In 1843, the Brits had entered into negotiations with the Republic of Texas on trade. This raised alarm bells. Uh, the ever alert Calhoun put his nationalist mask on once again as John Tyler's Secretary of State, he urged the annexation of Texas, which would extend slavery. Meanwhile, free state Democrats argued for annexation on the grounds that the Brits might succeed in containing American expansion. 
After the Senate refused to go along, the Whig Party dumped Tyler, ran Clay in the 1844 election, and as you know, the Democrats nominated James K. Polk, a Tennessee man, as a compromise between the northern and the southern wings of the party. Polk won, the Senate reversed itself and ratified the annexation treaty. Some northern Democrats now began to suspect a pro-slavery conspiracy to dominate their party. Polk's subsequent war on Mexico was declared by Congress. Lincoln was one of only 14 congressmen who voted against declaring war, suspecting the expansionist tendencies of the slaveholders, but more pertinently for our purposes, considering Polk's order to advance the U.S. Army into disputed territories in an attempt, obviously successful, to provoke the Mexicans to engage and therefore to induce Congress to declare war. We'll get them to attack us, and then we'll, they'll have to declare, uh, the Congress will have to declare. Uh, this strained the constitutional limits of executive power, making the president into a sort of monarch in, 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 in Lincoln's estimation. Accordingly, I think he would uh, urge skepticism if confronted with such events as, for example, the sinking of the Maine and the Havana Harbor, uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, and, uh, and, and even maybe the war, of the, the WMD issue in Iraq. He wouldn't necessarily not go in on one of these wars. You can't print out. But he'd be cautious about such claims if he, if he saw, heard them today. He wouldn't want the president boxing in Congress uh, too readily. He'd, be, uh, he'd kick the tires pretty hard on any of those things. Uh, during the Civil War, um, the British policy, again, this is at the end of his career, uh, British policy again worried Americans. In May of 1861, expecting the Confederacy to win independence, the British recognized the belligerency of the Confederacy, a move that often precedes formal diplomatic recognition. One of the great accounts of this, by the way, is the chapter in Henry Adams, uh, uh, Education of Henry Adams. Um, both the Tory administration of Lord Palmerston and the Liberal Party opposition leader, William Gladstone, looked forward to seeking the permanent division of the United States, despite Britain's long-standing opposition to slavery and to the slave trade. British opposition to the war centered among those public figures identified with the principled support of liberty. Richard Cobden, John Stuart Mill, and most impressively, John Eliot Cairns, uh, or later called the last of the classical economists, who wrote, probably the last in Britain at any rate, who uh, wrote the, his book, The Slave Power, in 1862. All of these men identified the Confederacy as an oligarchy, as not a real Republican regime, in effect taking the position of the Republican Party that, uh, that the Republicans had held since their uh, inception six or seven years earlier. The crisis came in November of 1861 when the United States naval vessel uh, when it uh, halted a Confederate ship en route to Europe with two diplomats, uh, James Mason of Virginia and uh, John Slidell of Louisiana, who were heading for Britain and for France, respectively. The Confederates were interned. With French backing, Lord Palmerston and his cabinet issued an ultimatum demanding the release of the diplomats. Although the capture was just about the only military triumph for the United States government in that bleak year, uh, Lincoln wisely told his cabinet, one war at a time. We don't want to get into it with these guys. This is the most powerful Navy in the world, among other things. He approved a message, this is the part I like, he approved a message drafted by his Secretary of State, William H. Seward, saying that America was pleased to see that the Brits had finally adopted the American position on the rights of neutral shipping, which they had denied in the years prior to the War of 1812. And with that, with that elegant climb down, he, uh, he released the prisoners and uh, avoided war with the, with, uh, with the mighty British Empire. On foreign policy then, Lincoln exhibited two statesmanlike characteristics. Knowing the necessity but also the danger of executive power, most notably the president's powers of, as commander in chief of the armed forces. He reserved those powers for the most urgent occasions. Moreover, he ranked the threats his country faced. He concentrated his forces and his attentions on the uppermost one. Today, for example, he'd advise Americans, I would guess, to consider which threats most seriously threaten their security. Do some triage, right? 
we've got all sorts of enemies out there. Well, which ones are the top ones? Which ones are the ones who can really do us damage and which ones can't? I would guess that he'd put China, Russia, and Iran ahead of Afghanistan, North Korea, and the Palestinian-Israeli dispute, for example. Right? To put China, Russia, and Iran first would mean to strengthen the Navy in the Pacific and the waters near the Middle East and to refocus NATO on the defense of, oh, Central Europe, sort of what it was intended to do in the first place. Like all major American presidents, Lincoln supported the right to revolution or regime change for all peoples. In his speech against the Mexican War, he said, any people anywhere, being inclined and having the power, have the right to rise up and shake off the existing government and form one that suits them better. This is a most valuable, most sacred right, a right which we hope is to liberate the world." Close quote. In finding ways to support revolutions that vindicate the natural rights of human beings, he would subject the revolutionaries to the demanding test of natural right. He would also subject himself, as in all else, to the hard test of prudence. So, conclusion. If you were with us today, Lincoln would do four main things. First, ask his fellow citizens to attend to the regimes and to polities in the United States and the world. Regime and polity. These are the keys to thinking clearly about politics, whether in 1776, 1861, 20, 2011. Second, urge the expansion of the realm of self-government in the United States and in the world. Politics, not bureaucracy. Third, exemplify self-government by offering reasoned arguments for those policies he endorsed. To do that, politicians really need to give themselves more time to think. They can have more time to think if they reduce the number of things that government does and restore important governing responsibilities to counties and municipalities so that elections and the politicking that surrounds them becomes important to ordinary people and therefore worth more of their time and attention. Finally, educate his fellow citizens respecting the purposes and institutions of the United States and the statesmen who employed those institutions to advance those purposes. That is the sort of thing that David Bob and his colleagues are doing here. I'm grateful for him, for, uh, to him for inviting me to join him in this enterprise today. Thank you. I believe we have time for questions. I've been asked, uh, you, 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 we don't have a microphone to pass around, so I'll repeat your question as best I can. That means you make them fairly short because I, as you can see, I'm an elderly man, losing his hair and his teeth. Sans teeth, sans everything, right? As uh, Shakespeare once said. So, uh, yes, sir. Okay, um, he, he, the question is uh, Lord Acton's letter to Lee um, basically saying that secession confirms democracy rather than uh, uh, disaffirms it, that, it's, uh, it's, that, it, that, that he, he agreed with Southern secessionism. Um, I think that Lincoln's response to that would be very simple, that you do have the right to revolution. You certainly do have the right to secession if your opponent is like the British king in 1776 or a Napoleon at Waterloo, namely someone who is out to violate the natural rights of the citizens. But once you're, but, but it's not a constitutional right unless of course we're actually in the Constitution. So the Southerners, if their natural rights had been violated, would then have had every right to secede from the, from the, from the Union and Lincoln would have applauded them might have joined them. I wonder if said Illinois should join you. Right? But that wasn't what happened. What they were doing was uh, defending something that was against natural right, um, namely slavery. Now, of course, there's a whole discourse that I'm sure you know and many of us know about 
well, whether is this true or not, uh, or is there a natural racial hierarchy, for example, which justifies uh, whites ruling blacks and, and, and American Indians and so on. That was part of race science, right, of the 19th century. Uh, Lincoln had nothing to do with that, though. He didn't agree with that, and uh, neither do I, if you want my opinion. Uh, yes? Okay, um, uh, the, la uh, the, the, the question is, uh, what's, the, what's the difference, or what, what causes Lincoln to start out affirming uh, his, his constitutional restrictions, uh, the, 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 the Republic and the Republicans' uh, acknowledgement of constitutional restrictions on uh, uh, invading the slaves, uh, invading uh, the right to have slaves in the, in the slave states, right? And he starts out there, but then uh, in the middle of the war, toward the end of the war, he emancipates the slaves. And uh, of course, in the war, the problem with the war, as, as in any war, and especially in a civil war, is that you now have military necessity involved. And so the, the liberation of the slaves, which was a good thing by natural right, remember, it's just that we can't touch it constitutionally. Once the war is, is on, then, uh, then, you, then you get something, uh, a different situation. Then you have it as a military measure. And sure enough, there was this competition, right, between Lincoln, who starts out saying, okay, we're going to emancipate these slaves and get them fighting against their masters, and Davis and the Southerners, who uh, are, are finally dragged into the idea of, well, Maybe we should emancipate them and see if they'll fight with us. The answer turned out to be that the slaves voted with their feet for the most part and joined the Union Army and didn't really trust the Confederates to give them emancipation at the end of the war. The second part of your question, I don't know. <laughs> My honest answer is I don't know. If you, if you want to say something about it, go right ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That, uh, the, yeah, this is uh, this is the, this is the doc. Now I know what you mean. The, the doctrine, the doctrine that uh, as a, as a war power, if 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 pro property can be confiscated, in other words, if you're going through and you're marching through a, a, a place and uh, and the the, the uh, opposing army is fed by the fields that are nearby, you are entitled as an act of war to confiscate those uh, the, the the food in those fields, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That, and 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 he and this gentleman is mentioning that uh, the the uh, the, uh, uh, the the slaves free up uh, Confederates for fighting the war because then they, they can leave, um, uh, and that's all. That would all be, but that's part of what I mean by the by the war powers. Basically, as a military necessity, all of these good things from Lincoln's uh, point of view is uh, are, are are to be accrued from. Uh, from uh, liberating the slaves, yeah, yeah. Sounds like everybody wants to go to lunch. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, what did my father do? <laughs> spoken, spoken like, spoken like someone who's a mother, no doubt herself, right? And so. Um, well, my father was uh, a, a guy who was, he'd, he'd been educated as an attorney. This is 1920. And he didn't like corporate law in New York, so he came back home to Cliffwood Beach, New Jersey, which is on the, it's not on the ocean shore, it's on the Raritan Bay shore. It's not far from New York. And the state of New Jersey <coughs> decided to run a highway. I think it was <coughs> today's Route 35 down to the shore. And so he and his partner bought up hundreds and thousands of acres along this area and developed them with bungalows for the people. There's no air conditioning in the 1920s, right? So they put these bungalows along the, sh the shore and they have this promotional material. Um, they had one sign that with a, with a girl in a bathing suit says, uh, meet me at the Jersey Shore. And, 
<laughs> so so uh, they, they made a lot of money in that real estate bubble of the 1920s. They lost a lot of it back in 1929, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I'd be sitting on a, on a plantation somewhere uh, uh, sipping mint juleps. Uh, uh, thank you.